Hello and welcome. My name is Faith Scheide, and I'm a TA specialist here at the PDG Birth to Five TA Center. It is my privilege to welcome you to the PDG Birth to Five Annual Convening State Response Plenary and to introduce the lineup of our distinguished presenters. As you can tell from the name of the session, we wanted to provide a time for states' voices to be heard. The objective of the session is for participants to hear state representatives respond to the federal leadership panel for Monday and the research to practice panel yesterday and how it relates to the work that they're doing in their states. I'll let you know about the session format for today. First, I'm gonna introduce all of the presenters and then each panelist will get to share the context of the work in their states. Then we'll have a deep dive into discussion about where our presenters will discuss their responses of what they heard and also the importance of the work that's occurring in their states. And then we'll close out with each panelist sharing a few concluding statements. First, I'd like to introduce our state presenters. First, we have Kelly Bohannon. She is the Director of Early Learning Programs for Washington's Department of Children, Youth, and Family. Kelly's responsibilities include providing visionary leadership, direction, and administrative oversight to the state's pre K program, the Early Childhood Education and Assistance Program, the Head, state Head Start Collaboration Office, the state's Integrated Pre K Initiative, and the Preschool Development Grant for a through five. Kelly has much experience and has been involved in different aspects of early childhood throughout her different roles. Kelly provided leadership and oversight to Washington's early childhood education and assistance programs, continued implementation in communities, and continued expansion efforts. She served as the Assistant Director for the McBee Technical Assistance Center at the Zero to Three, and has served as Deputy Director of Child Care Aware of Washington. Additionally, Kelly has also served as an adjunct faculty for the University of Washington's College of Education, Department of Early Childhood and Family Studies. We are also joined by Dr. Jamila Jordan. Dr. Jordan, Jordan serves as the Executive Director of the Illinois Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development. In this role, she supports the development and implementation of early childhood policy across multiple state agencies. Dr. Jordan has served in various leadership and service positions, which includes the past vice president of the governing board of the National Association for the Education of Young Children, also known as NACI. Kayla Rosen is the director of early childhood strategy in the Rhode Island governor's office and leads the state's interagency early childhood governance structure to support implementation of shared strategic plan. She has extensive experience in policy, having worked in Rhode Island's Executive Office of Human and Health Services and Rhode Island's Children's Cabinet. And finally, we're joined by Dr. Pamela Chulove Walker. Dr. Chulove Walker is the Senior Director of Early Learning and Early Education with the Alabama Department of Early Education, Early Childhood Education. She has over 20 years of demonstrated leadership in a variety of early care and learning models, including university-affiliated Birth to Five, Head Start, Early Head Start, Faith-Based Preschool, and First Class Pre-K. Additionally, she has served as adjunct faculty member and was previously named to a top three national finalist for Child Care Director of the Year by the Association for Early Learning Leaders. She is quote, honored to have the opportunity to work alongside others to ensure high quality, comprehensive services happen for children and families in the state of Alabama. We are so glad that you are all here. All right. We're going to start off with each of the presenters sharing a little bit about the context of the work that they are doing in their state. We're going to start off with Dr. Pamela Trula, Alabama. Hello, everybody. It is indeed an honor uh, to be here to talk with you all uh, a little bit this afternoon about the work that is happening uh, in the state of Alabama, uh, to share some of that work and uh, to hear from my peers the work that is happening, of course, in their state as, as well. Um, the Alabama Department of Early Childhood Education is part of the governor's cabinet uh, in our state and is the umbrella organization for several programs uh, and initiatives surrounding uh, birth through um, age eight. 
These include uh, uh, the Alabama Children's Policy Councils, uh, which are early childhood uh, advisory councils that are established locally in each of our counties and provide um, information and, and feedback uh, about the needs that are happening in their local communities. Um, the Head Start uh, State Collaboration uh, Office is part of our department, as well as First Teacher Home Visiting. Uh, we also have Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health uh, and First Class Pre-K, um, which is our state-funded pre-K program for four-year-old children. And along with that, uh, as part of the Governor's Strong Start, Strong Finish initiative, we've also incorporated pre-K through third grade integrated approach to early learning. Uh, and this supports kindergarten through grade three classrooms in the delivery of high quality early learning experiences that align with the first class pre-K uh, developmental framework. Um, I share this foundational information just to paint a picture of the existing framework uh, that has helped to support the work we have done and are continuing uh, to do through our PDGB5 grant. The uh, culmination of our statewide needs assessment identified four priority areas for focused attention. And these priority areas were ensuring uh, that families had access to high quality early care and education services and that these services were not only available, but those services were, services were also affordable because what is one without the other, having access to them and then not being able to afford the services um, that are right there in your community. Uh, engaging families as partners in early care and education uh, and making sure that they had up-to-date information uh, and ready access to comprehensive service supports. Uh, so we're talking in terms of one-stop shopping, if you will, models so that parents then uh, are able to then uh, quickly uh, access information that they, um, that they are needing uh, to have at their fingertips. Uh, building and retaining a highly skilled and a highly qualified, well-supported uh, early care and education workforce is essential. And we've all been in conversations about uh, workforce development in early uh, care and education and what that looks like for our field um, currently. And the last area was around quality and accountability. How do we ensure early care and education programs are high quality and then maintain and support uh, accountability for rigorous standards uh, once that those quality indicators have been identified. I am certain that these are topics that echo up throughout many of your own state's goals, but the real key uh, to all of this was how to systematically address these issues. So perhaps one of the biggest highlights uh, for Alabama in this work uh, was the creation of a statewide steering committee. Now, um, we really, really worked very hard to actively engage stakeholders who were all vested in early care and education systems. Uh, we have representatives from the governor's office, the business community, higher ed, research and evaluation, early intervention, mental health, public health, Department of Human Resources. Um, and all of these individuals came together, put down the silos and focused on building systems around the identified priority areas. Um, and this was so key to the work that has been able to uh, happen uh, and the work that is continuing to happen in our state. Um, I'm pleased to join you today and look forward to sharing uh, additional information throughout the seminar. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. And hello to everyone. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here and be surrounded by um, my other three colleagues from the other states and just to be a part of this PDG community. Um, we refer to the PDG in our state as a game changer, and um, I'm sure there will be Lots of highlights from all of us um, that speak to the really important role that this grant and policy at the federal level has played in each of our states and across the country. Um, but we'll just start by saying um, I'm the director of early learning programs, um, as Faith shared in the beginning, for the Washington State Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Um, and just to want to begin by saying that the PDG couldn't have come at a better time for our state with the type of systems building focus that the grant has. Um, we um, had existed sort of sort of the, lot, the decade previously um, inside the creation of a brand new cabinet level agency called the Department of Early Learning, had created a 10-year early learning plan that brought stakeholders and partners together across the system. It really defined and grounded our system in a framework that allowed us to do this work in a shared and collaborative way and would say that it enabled us to really take advantage of and le leverage the federal and state opportunities 
um, to advance our system over those 10 years and got to 2020 at the end of that 10, those 10 years or seeing 2020 coming um, and knew that it was time um, for us to really revamp our state strategic direction. And so the PDG really came at a time that was perfect for that and uh, to give us the opportunity to really dig deep um, in a needs assessment and then develop a new plan um, for the next many years. And so um, in the midst of that happening, um, our state also merged our state level agency of early learning that really was the coordinating, um, had become the coordinating body, body for our early childhood systems work in our state and created the Department of Children, Youth and Families, which combined our state's uh, uh, Children's Administration, which is Child Protective Services and Child Welfare and Juvenile Rehabilitation into one agency with the hope of really turning on its head an intervention approach with a prevention approach um, and really using um, the strength that we know is in early childhood systems to do that. And um, so with that opportunity, um, we really saw the PDG as a lever for us to advance that mission um, in our state with that opportunity. So for us, I would just say that one of the most significant contributions of the PDG has been the opportunity for system capacity building, um, which I think many of you know is often overlooked and underappreciated in policy and funding decisions. So we, as I've said, spent the last couple of decades in Washington taking advantage of all of the different opportunities coming our way to set a solid foundation in our system. Um, but we still have so much to do in solidifying our infrastructure and capacity elements to really fill gaps. Um, to help us um, hold up what we've done to date and to sustain it. And the PDG is really helping us to do a lot of that. But again, isn't really paid attention to um, as other funding and, and policy decisions are made, at least within our state. And so that um, it has brought a lot of light to the importance of infrastructure and capacity and taking our system to the next level. The other piece for us that I think is critically important to highlight here is that while we were really proud of the progress we made with that first 10 year early learning plan, what we identified as we really dug into the data is that the outcomes um, for the most marginalized communities in our state wasn't changing. And so we knew we had to do something different. If we were going to change that experience and change the outcomes, we needed to really turn some things over. And we saw the PDG as an opportunity for us um, to really embed um, intentional equity practice in our people, um, in our processes, in our policies and practices, um, with a focus on co-designing with lived experts um, and to really take that to the next level. And so through um, the development of that needs assessment and our strategic plan um, and into all the other PDG activities, we really threaded that um, and have continued to think about how we build that at an individual, um, an institutional and a structural level. And so um, what we're really hoping to do is just witness some different impact. Um, through the efforts of the PDG, particularly the impact um, that we want to have on communities that are traditionally and historically most marginalized in our state. So that is the, that's the magic that we see in the PDG and that we're hopeful for um, it continuing um, into the future. And I'm going to pass it on to Kayla. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here and just wonderful to be on this panel with colleagues who I'm inspired by. And as you're talking, I want to ask you many more questions. Um, Rhode Island is a very different state than many others. I think as folks know, we're quite small. We have about 10,000 kids in every single birth cohort. And because it's such a small state, I think we get to be very aspirational in our goals that we want to reach every single child and do so equitably. And I think PDG has been foundational for us as we think about what those goals will be and bringing everyone to the table to help us achieve those goals. So in the initial grant, we you know, developed our strategic plan and we developed a new governance structure, a kind of coordinated governance structure across our state agencies to bring everyone involved with little kids to the table and have a way to have shared decision making, which we didn't have before. I think as many of the government the last couple of days have talked about, we have many cabinet members who are peers and they couldn't make decisions on behalf of each other. By having shared governance that PDG enabled, we're able to come to decisions and drive the work forward. A big part of that has been having shared goals. So the five kind of foundational objectives of our plan are aimed towards getting, you know, all of our kids on a path to reading proficiently in third grade. 
And those five objectives for us are having high quality programs in early learning across the mixed delivery system. It's uh, making sure we have equitable access to services and supports in a timely fashion for our communities and having universal pre-K as kind of a standalone goal within that early learning piece. And all of that is founded on having sustainable funding, sustainable governance, and integrated data where we can really track what we're doing and doing so equitably. PDG has been the thing that's kept everyone at the table through the pandemic, through all, all of the work that's happening uh, right now as we are still in the pandemic for us to continue to make progress. And some of the examples of that have been our ability to make um, shared funding decisions. So not just in PDG, where we have almost 30 activities across four state agencies happening to move forward those goals, um, but also as we think about stimulus funding. We can look at the data holistically across our system and say, where are we seeing um, challenges and crises as a result of the pandemic? And how do we collectively think about that investment? And as an example of that, our governor put out a, a stimulus proposal to use our state fiscal recovery fund last week. It's a supplemental budget request to our General Assembly, and it included early childhood priorities that several agencies stand behind. So it's not just one agency wanting something, it's all of us together wanting to see that advancement for kids. And that included retention bonuses for the child care workforce to make sure that we're, you know, investing in our child care workforce to have fair compensation, to honor the work that's happening, and to make sure that we can have enough child care workers in the field given the work for shortages across the system. Startup grants for new family child care, uh, business owners who want to open a new family child care, uh, support services uh, and stabilization for early intervention, and stabilization for our pediatric community, because we were really seeing just crises across the board. But that shared governance allowed us to have a space to talk about what we needed in early childhood, make those shared decisions, and drive forward. So it's really, I think Kelly's term of game changer is an excellent one because I think it's very true and has been um, something that brings everyone to the table. And so I'm excited to talk more about what's happening in Rhode Island as we continue this, but just as a foundation, that um, shared governance has been uh, really the key that has let us move forward. So with that, I'm going to turn, uh, turn it over to um, Dr. Jordan to talk about her state. Thank you, uh, Kayla, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to join you today. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Illinois Governor's Office of uh, Early Childhood Development. So in my role, I serve as the executive director. Uh, we refer to uh, the office as uh, GOECD. I serve as the uh, executive director, and in that role, GOECD, we serve as the convener of our uh, interagency team, which is representative of our child and family serving uh, state agencies. Uh, in addition, we serve as the convener of our early learning council uh, within the state. What we've been able to do uh, as far as our PDG uh, has supported our efforts to stand up um, our early learning council. Uh, in addition, we've had the opportunity to stand up a statewide family advisory committee. Uh, we're really excited uh, about this opportunity. Uh, as you heard in the welcoming address, as well as in the research to practice, uh, the importance of family uh, engagement, family voice, uh, beneficiary voice. And so for the first time in the history of Illinois, we actually have family voice in decision discuss, um, in uh, discussions uh, related to policy as well as um, uh, decisions. Uh, and so we're very uh, happy about that work. Uh, in addition, we're currently uh, working on our uh, needs assessment. And as part of that work, uh, GOECD, we, have, we serve as the lead for the PDGB5 grant in the state. Uh, but as part of that work, we've been able to convene a data definition uh, advisory uh, committee. And again, this committee has been convened to really look across uh, our system. And we don't want to use the word consensus, but to, um, you know, have some agreement about the definitions, no matter where individuals are within our mixed delivery system, that we have some agreement uh, as it relates to um, uh, our definitions. 
uh, that will help us maintain as we think about, uh, you know, data, which was also mentioned in our uh, welcome, as well as the research to practice to uh, ensure the integrity of our, our data, that what we're, we're all in agreement that whatever data we're pulling, that we're pulling, you know, the data that we all agree, uh, you know, we need. Um, in addition, we are, uh, I don't want to say we're updating our needs assessment because a lot has happened uh, since the um, last uh, uh, strategic plan. The focus this time, uh, we are embedding a um, racial equity social justice framework as part of our strategic plan. But Again, within the state, uh, since our last plan, we've had, uh, like everyone else, the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, we've launched a prenatal to three policy agenda uh, within our state. Uh, we've also, uh, through the governor's initiation, uh, we have the funding uh, commission report. We've also launched within the state our learning renewal efforts uh, as part of our P20 council. Uh, we have also, uh, within the state, we have uh, in the process of building out an infrastructure to address infant and early childhood mental health consultation. Illinois is one of a few states that offers mental health consultation across mixed delivery systems. And so we're looking, um, we're being very intentional not only because it's the right thing to do, but we're also aware of the impact that the uh, the pandemic has had on our children, families, as well as our early childhood workforce. And so we want to ensure that, um, first of all, that we have the consultants, a number of consultants available within the state, as well as we want to reduce, uh, you know, the wait time uh, for uh, consultations. And then finally, uh, you know, I, I wanted to mention that we are also, um, you know, in the process of standing up, which I'll talk more about later. We're in the process of standing up regional and community system uh, infrastructure uh, within the state that will allow communities to um, really have, uh, you know, local, uh, you know, input as far as, uh, you know, what's happening in their respective communities. And so I really want to save time for us to, uh, you know, really, I could go on uh, as far as, uh, you know, the state, of course, you know, the governor, you know, has, uh, you know, announced, uh, you know, bonuses, uh, you know, as well as, uh, you know, address co-pays for, you know, families, uh, increase reimbursements for, you know, providers. So we could be here, you know, for a while, but I want to be sure that we have an opportunity to uh, to to uh, to talk. So, thank you, Faith. Thank you very much, Jamila. You're welcome. Um, it sounds like great things are happening um, for children and their families in each of your states. Yes. Um, <laughs> some of you guys mentioned um, PDG when you were sharing your state context, um, but if you could discuss in greater detail. Uh, why the opportunity of PDG birth to five is so critical right now. Um, Pamela, would you start us off? You know, when I, I think about that uh, question, and I, I, you know, hear what Kelly and Kayla and, and Dr. Jordan is saying uh, about the things that are happening in their state. In their states, uh, at this time, we think about what's happening with PDG B5. It's almost like... Um, coordination, collaboration, systems building, shared decision making, and funding all hit a collision course with a pandemic, right? <laughs> and so it's like when those things hit, it became a perfect storm, uh, if you will, uh, and brewed up all the things that uh, many of us who've been in early child care and education for so many years have, have always known. But it brewed it up, it stirred it up. And so now other individuals who were on the outside, who were looking in, who had this uh, um, kind of like this shielded glance, this shielded vision of what uh, was actually happening in early child care and education, all of a sudden all that was blown away. Like the perfect storm came and it blew all those things away. And we finally have the, the key players at the table and they're listening. They're not just at the table, but they're at the table and they're listening. Uh, the decision makers are sitting down and they're hearing what we have had to say all along about 
what happens and what needs to happen in early child care and, and education if we are really going to be as impactful uh, in the lives of children and families as we would like to think we can be and know that we can be when we have high quality programming um, in place for children and families. So as we've had opportunity to then bring these players to the table, we have individuals from the, the business community who are now going, hey, we, we, we have to have employees. Child care centers have to be open, right? Um, and so how are we going to get those child care centers open so that our employees can get back to, um, to the business at hand? So now it becomes important to them. And then we have child care uh, center owners and family child care providers who are saying, well, if you you know, if they're going to come back to the table, then we have to make sure um, that we're paying them uh, what they are. Uh, we know it's a high responsibility uh, position. We know it's one of the greatest professions uh, ever, and it has high responsibility. It also has high accountability. And so when we're talking about being responsive to individuals uh, and, and the needs that they have to have a, a living wage. So now they're at the table saying, well, we need more funding to be able to uh, support this. Uh, and then we have uh, individuals uh, who are providing services. Uh, Dr. Jordan mentioned uh, infant and early childhood uh, um, mental health. Uh, and we're not just talking about infant and early childhood mental health, but we're talking about mental health needs of, of our staff too, right? Uh, so we have uh, uh, adults who are in need of, of those um, mental health services as they are providing supports and uh, to our, uh, our our youngest our youngest learners. Uh, so one of the things that has uh, made PDGB5 so critical uh, right now is that it has um, already convened a lot of those players at the table for those conversations conversations and for those shared uh, decisions that that need to be be made and they're listening and they're saying what can what is our next steps and how can we help how can we provide additional opportunities and additional support for um for early child care uh and the early child care community so i think that uh as far as it being uh, a critical element right now it couldn't have come at a better time uh in the midst of a, a pandemic uh to bring to light those things that we know um have been very challenging to our profession but hopefully um we're going to get some good things that evolve from this And I can just add, I can add on to that. I can't say enough about, you know, just building on this notion that the pandemic has just further exacerbated inequities in our communities. So for again, for particularly for marginalized communities. And when I say that, I really mean for all the adults and children's lives, you know, those who care and love for the children that we're talking about. So their families and providers. Um, and, you know, we already had a workforce crisis. We already had lots of child care crisis underway and the pandemic just layered onto that even more and the pdg for our state has brought to us an ability to be nimble i remember when um you know that march 2020 period of time happened and hit the scene the pdg team was all over it at hhs and from the ta center um talking with states and trying to figure out with all of us how can we be nimble? How can we use this to respond in the way that's needed for children and families and providers right now? And I just can't say enough about that. Um, so I think the nimbleness of this grant has been everything. Um, I talked in the beginning when I was doing context setting for Washington State, the importance of this being a capacity building grant. And again, just I can't emphasize enough the importance of states having the ability to have a funding stream and a policy that allows us to look at all these other opportunities that have been set in place for us. So McV Home Visiting, Head Start and Early Head Start, Migrant Seasonal Head Start, Tribal Head Start, Child Care Development Fund, and then all the different state policies. And of course, I'm leaving lots of things out, um, CAPTA and all sorts of things that we have um, in the foundations of providing services in our state. The PDG really allows us to be filling gaps. Um, and being a connector in places that we have not been able to before. So resource and referral, really strengthening coordination referral systems for families. Infant early childhood mental health consultation or mental health consultation systems elements in general. Um, I just can't say enough about it. One of the things that we're really proud of in our state that has been um, a, a major lever point for us in the child welfare system is using the PDG to develop early childhood Child, early childhood and child welfare liaisons um, who exist inside of those offices in, in communities and are have become the immediate referral source and partners 
with whoever is delivering service um, across different types of services for families and young children in those communities. Um, and it has just really changed the game for us in that way. So I could go on and on. So I think being nimble, you know, the, the ability of this grant to be nimble, um, the capacity building element, the, which allows for that bridge building, but the leverage, it's, it's so genius in that way that it allows us to leverage all these other things that the feds um, and our states have enacted in policy. It's just, it's been huge in that way. Kelly, I, um, I, I appreciate your mentioning uh, Nimble. When we had to pivot in March of 2020, uh, you know, that became our mantra, you know, as far as, uh, you know, being, being Nimble. We had to pivot quickly, as you know, to, you know, support our, you know, our workforce, uh, you know, our children, our, our families. And so uh, I appreciate your mentioning uh, Nimble. I also want to say PDGB5 has really been, uh, you know, critical. For, for Illinois, uh, as you mentioned, as far as leveraging. And so it's really been helpful to us as far as supporting, uh, supporting our, our workforce, again, who was impacted, uh, you know, by the, uh, you know, the pandemic. And I, I really want to, you know, take this opportunity, uh, you know, to really help on individuals understand just how much impact uh, the PDG B5 grant had on our workforce. Um, we have a credentialing system within the state. Uh, and so with the PDG B5 during this time, we've been able to support our workforce in attaining uh, their credential. Uh, the fee is $65. But, uh, you know, due to the impact of the pandemic, as well as, uh, you know, just wages, um, we found through data collection that that was a barrier for our workforce. And so as a result of PDG B5, um, close to 4,000 4, credential applications was submitted, uh, you know, to our state organization from individuals from the workforce who were needing to um, either a new credential, many of which had not even submitted. They were eligible for the credential, but they had not submitted uh, because of the fee. Uh, we've been able to cover renewals in the case of some that might have multiple credentials. Um, you know, that was definitely a game changer to be able to renew those credentials because many of them had not been renewed. Uh, in addition, uh, we've been able to partner with our higher ed institutions within the state, five higher ed institutions to, you know, support uh, cohorts and helping early childhood professionals uh, work towards uh, credential and uh, degree attainment. And we've been able to focus on uh, professionals within our rural communities, uh, as well as those caring for infants and toddlers and if you remember, this was a focus for Washington, uh, D.C., uh, they mentioned during our uh, research to practice session, uh, those individuals uh, who are in um, early childhood education. Uh, again, that was mentioned by all of the presenters um, in that session. And also supports for educators of, of color. So the PDGB5 has, has also, I want to add the word innovation. It also um, allowed us to be really uh, in Illinois to really be innovative in that we were able to support our um, credential competency project. And so we're, Illinois is leading the way as far as moving towards a competency-based teacher preparation um, approach and the development of online course modules. And so our investments in uh, the workforce, the cohorts, the development of online modules, our targeted uh, financial supports have informed the design of our newly launched Early Childhood Access Consortium for Equity. So when we talk about leveraging, we are launching this uh, consortium with a $200 million investment from the American Rescue Plan Act funds. And so all of the PDG work was able to feed into and inform, you know, the launch of that consortium. So that's an idea of innovation and uh, leveraging. And then, uh, you know, just a couple of more um, 
I'd love to talk about Illinois. Our, our longitudinal data system, uh, you know, we've been able to make investments in our, uh, you know, Kelly, you had mentioned data. So again, uh, you know, it's definitely informed our, our efforts as we've been uh, investing our uh, ARPA resources. We've used that data to, uh, you know, identify areas of greatest need. And then finally, our investments in our integrated referral and information system known as IRIS. Uh, that system will help us prepare as we uh, look forward to launching our regional and community systems uh, to be able to have that data available for uh, at the community level for the community. So that's just a few of the, you know, the opportunities that we've been able to, to leverage, uh, you know, in Illinois. Thanks to PDGB5. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so you all share that PDG grant has had great impact in your states, even through different challenges especially COVID. Yes. Can you tell us more about how you leveraged PDG grant to, and I'm going to grab onto Kelly's phrase, change the game in your state. So tell us in, in more detail about um, how you changed the game. Um, Kayla, would you start us off? Happy to. And I, I do love that phrase. So big credit to Kelly for introducing that. It's been kind of a catchphrase as we've come together for this panel. Um, you know, really echoing what everyone just talked about. I think uh, PDG has been a game changer in, in a couple of ways for us. The first is that it has allowed us to be innovative and build capacity. And I think of that as it's allowed us to do things we always said we wanted to do, but without PDG would not have been able to do. And so an example of that in our state, a couple of examples. The first is for pre-K. We have, you know, a, a very high quality pre-K program for four years that we've been trying to reach 7,000 kids, which for us would be universal. Um, and we have been slowly increasing year over year. But we've been doing that in a way where every classroom that opened had to be an empty classroom where no kids were displaced because we wanted to make sure that we weren't turning infant toddler classrooms into pre-K classrooms. But by requiring an empty classroom, we created all sorts of other problems for ourselves. We had a facilities problem we had kind of a ceiling on where we could really expand. So we knew we needed to have some sort of new way to expand that allowed us to be in new communities, reach more kids, and also move away from something that felt inequitable, which is you could have a classroom in a childcare center that was this high quality pre-K program next to another four-year-old program that didn't have pre-K dollars, um, that did not have the same curriculum, materials, bachelor degree teacher at the front of the classroom. So we, we needed to do something, um, but without PDG, we wouldn't have had really the opportunity, the governance structure, um, and the impetus and the funds to do something different. And so it allowed us to have a cross-agency team come together between our education department and our human services department to think about new things that we can do. And that includes our Head Start collaboration director as well. So we were able to develop five, or excuse me, four new service delivery models that layered and braided funds from Head Start, from our local funding formulas for schools, and from the child care assistance program to allow us to open classrooms that were already existing four-year-old classrooms by layering quality dollars on top and turning them into high quality programs by extending the hours or the days of Head Start to meet the standards of pre-K that we had set out. Um, and as a result, we've been able to reach, I think, 516 new children in just one year at way less uh, new money than we ever would have been able to before. That's the type of innovation that we've been able to do as a result of PDG that we're incredibly grateful for. Other things like that are in the data system world, in the governance world, um, and we can talk about that in more depth. Just the other thing I'd briefly add is that it's allowed PDG, the second thing it's allowed us to do is be really responsive to data and to need. Um, we saw, you know, as everyone is seeing, there is an extreme uh, crisis happening in our workforce. And as a result of PDG, what we've been able to see that across the board and think innovatively about how we're using not only PDG, but other opportunities. So we've actually been reading everything Illinois is doing because we're very inspired by your state, um, you. trying to think about how we can have more um, affordable, uh, possible pathways to reach credentialing uh, for incumbent educators, because what we don't want is for our workforce um, to be displaced if we were to require higher degrees. 
So we want to make sure that we're investing in our existing workforce, supporting people in growing their credentials and doing that in an innovative way. And we were able to take, I think it was about $2 million of gear funds plus PDG planning money for us to be able to develop um, the plans for those pathways and those are underway. So a really incredible game-changing stuff that uh, PDG has let us do. Um, with that, I'd love to turn it over to um, Pamela to talk more about what's happening in Alabama. Wow, it, it really gets exciting as you as you hear the things that are happening uh, across other states, and you think it was like, oh yes, oh gosh, we have a we we started that too. Oh, it allowed us to do that too. Uh, <laughs> and I, 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 you know, it's you know to use Kelly's words, and she t- talks in terms of uh, filling gaps, and making connections, filling gaps, and making connections, right? Um, because I really think that that has been what has changed the game uh, for um, a lot of us uh, across the various states is that we've looked at those areas where we had gaps and then we've had the funding that has been uh, um, provided to us through PDGB5 to connect um, those gaps and then to fill those bridges across those gaps uh, in, in you know, what I would hope are capacity building and sustainable kinds of ways. Uh, in our uh, state, uh, we've been very proud of our um, first class pre-K, our voluntary program for um, uh, four-year-old children uh, and its mixed delivery model. Uh, so, but as we were thinking in terms of what happens across uh, birth to age three uh, and the needs that they have, uh, we, you know, we're very proud that we have pay parity uh, across our first class pre-K um, systems with uh, K-12. Uh, that's amazing when you can have uh, teachers who are in child care centers and Head Start programs and faith-based uh, centers who say, you know, I teach in this classroom and I make the same amount of money as if I were, if I were a teacher in uh, pre-K, because we won't uh, in K-12, because when we look at high quality programming and the work that is required, uh, we know that, um, you know, that the education that is required in these classrooms is the same. And so why the, should they not have equal play, pay? So what PDG allowed us to do was to look at that across B3. And why can't we then create uh, a model that says, I am an infant teacher. I need to be paid 40 plus thousand dollars entry level salary as an infant teacher. Uh, I have a, the same credentials. Uh, so why can I not have the same pay? So this uh, these funds allowed us to actually take and utilize um, the mixed delivery model that we have with first class pre pre-K across B3. So in our, we have an elementary school uh, that uh, added infant and toddler classrooms who all their teachers are, um, uh, receive the same pay, their pay parity with K-12. Uh, we have a faith-based uh, program, uh, the same way, pay parity. And then we didn't just do um, these programs and say, okay, here we are, private child care, let's uh, see how we build this model, but how do we build it in a sustainable way? So we were able to actually then have conversations, look at um, budgets, look at sustainability models and sustainability plans, and then help them actually then incorporate models in their programs so that um, once, you know, we're gone and we're off off the table, uh, we still have programs that are in existence through uh, collaborations that we have with uh, with them and funds that they'll be able to receive through QRS models uh, with our uh, agency and increases in uh, support services in their programs, uh, in kind services for some of them who had other community partners and stakeholders who were willing to invest uh, in their programs. And then some with a, a few tuition increases, but to just know that that the model can exist uh, and that it is a sustainable model across um, the birth, the three world and not just uh, with first class pre-K. Uh, and we wouldn't have been able to do that uh, without uh, the funds that we were able to receive from um, PDGB5. We were also able to uh, increase the the number of infant early childhood mental health uh, consultants that we have who are available. Um, So we did this in uh, collaboration with the uh, Alabama Department of of Mental Health. Uh, So in partnership is we uh, we then come in with the framework and say, what does this need to look like in order to be able to support services for um, for. 
for teachers and for children and for families who are uh, in uh, birth to uh, five worlds. Uh, and then they came in and said, hey, we'll partner with you all. If you all can do this on this side, then we can pick it up at this particular juncture so that we can continue to build that uh, capacity and sustain the things that we know are very important uh, in our uh, community. Um, and then one of the things that we just uh, were able uh, to sign off on this past uh, June uh, was the uh, first early um, childhood educator apprenticeship uh, program in our state. Uh, and so we uh, now have a model in, pl in place uh, for uh, apprentices. Kayla mentioned what happens to those incumbent workers are, who are there. Uh, so now we have mentor support and on the job learning and we have a model in place. Uh, and we have our, our first two apprentices who have signed on uh, with, uh, with an apprenticeship in, in our state. Uh, there will be incremental bumps in their wages as they complete uh, the three different stages of this of their uh, apprenticeship. And then when they actually com complete their program, they too uh, will be receiving um, pay parity with uh, their K-12 uh, uh, counterparts. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of things in, in early child care world. And so we're really excited about, uh, about that work that is happening here in Alabama through PDGB5. Great. I, uh, I'm, I'm taking lots of notes, uh, uh, Faith. Uh, so, Kayla, first of all, thank you for sharing uh, your your observation about our, uh, you know, credentialing system and, um, you know, Pamela, all the work that's happening in your state. So for us, this, uh, you know, as far as our game changer, um, you know, one of the themes that we've heard, um, not, you know, today in this conference or this convening uh, is data data and more data. And so the investment of PDG B5 uh, funds in our longitudinal data system uh, has been a huge game changer uh, for Illinois. Uh, data has been a priority, uh, you know, in the state, but the PDG B5 funding has allowed us to have the opportunity to uh, partner with our state agency um, but what's been significant for us is that we've been able to partner with our Illinois Head Start Association. And so we are just, um, you know, delighted to have that partnership with our Head Start Association uh, to have the opportunity to include data for uh, Head Start and early Head Start so that we have a, a comprehensive um, view of our, our mixed delivery uh, system um, uh, as part of our, our work. In addition, we've been able to um, look at a governance structure uh, so we've been able to, uh, you know, establish and work towards a governance structure, uh, develop data share agreements, you know, a lot of the foundational pieces that um, have not, in fact, uh, been in place. As part of this uh, development, and again, thanks to PDGB5 uh, funding, uh, we are developing a early childhood participation data database. And I'm happy to share, uh, you know, this afternoon that um, that participation database is actually the first uh, use case on our longitudinal data system 2.0, as it's, as it's called. And so, you know, um, that is a huge game changer as we, you know, we think about um, the one of the critical themes as it relates to the databases is, is equity. And so it will give us an opportunity, provide an opportunity to know where Illinois' children are, uh, you know, what services they're receiving. Um, you know, we've certainly heard in the research to practice uh, the challenges around um, having information related to race and ethnicity. And so we just want to be sure that we are meeting the needs of, um, you know, Illinois children, including our children that have been identified uh, within our priority populations. This is definitely uh, important to the mission of GOECD as well as the uh, administration. And we want to be sure that these resources are, um, are distributed in a way that we can expand our services as we uh, move forward. And then finally, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're standing up regional councils within the state. And so we, um, we envision, uh, you know, the data that is within uh, this longitudinal data system will also support local planning within those regional councils. 
So that's a huge game changer for us. Thank you. I'm You're really welcome. thrilled to hear about how, the, like the details of how all of you are, are changing your states from the inside out. Yesterday, we heard from three different states and, um, that shared how they were working with vulnerable populations in one way or another to increase access and, and quality. And then we had a discussant share her perspectives on their work and her work through an equity lens. How is your state thinking about equity in the context of its infrastructure and early childhood and care, education and care settings? Um, what, did, what did hearing the researchers and, and discussants talk about equity? Um, what did it, how did it resonate with you and with your work? Kelly, would you get us started? I would be honored. Um, and, you know, I'm just coming off of a session just before this where we talked about um, ways that we're approaching this through the opportunity of the PDG. And I think I just want to start by saying um, just how exciting it is. I know that it's kind of funny to talk about Game Changer. Um, and just want to say that when we started, uh, when we embarked on this process of the PDG back in 2019, um, one of my colleagues and I who were leading the effort for the state and the agency um, we wrote on a piece of paper, this grant is going to be a game changer. And I still have it. It's hanging in my office and I need to go get it because I'm no longer in that office very often, but someday I'll share it with all of you. Um, and I just love that we've kind of now developed this collective mantra, um, because this is a community. Um, this is truly a community, this PDG, and it's really, really special. So again, just a shout out to my colleagues here and, our, uh, our partners at HHS and the TA Center and all the states who are coming together to learn from each other because it really is uh, a game changer. Um, but again, I think for us, the game changer thing came in many ways because of what we needed to do for equity. It's often that as states we um, or entities uh, coming together in our communities, we write these really eloquent uh, mission statements and we, and, we, and we talk about the value of equity, but oftentimes it's a checkbox. And um, the data that we continue to look at, um, uh, we no longer could continue to look at that data in good faith. We had to do something different um, because we know that we are going to get the same result if we don't change the way we're doing things, particularly for marginalized communities. And that was the game changer element for us um, in what we saw with the PDG. So our PDG was written um, in both our applications um, with the central aim of dismantling systemic racism and really interrupting the patterns and practices that we know contribute um, to the marginalization, to the oppression, um, to the imposing of cultural norms um, on just a wide array of, uh, of the underserved populations that we all serve and care so much about changing um, the experience for. Um, and so while, you know, I explained in the beginning when I set context that we made a lot of strides in the first 10 years um, of really focusing on systems development and having a plan um, to change things. Um, but, you know, as we continued to see what was happening, it just wasn't, it wasn't making a difference. And so the PDG um, brought to us the opportunity to just bring a new level of capacity um, to our commitment to facilitate intentional design um, if we were gonna interrupt patterns, not just talk about it, um, not just create the nice statements, but to really change conditions, can cha change behaviors, um, and do the real work um, uh, to see it change. And so we are bringing that commitment to life um, through this grant. Um, and a lot of ways for us, it comes down to the transfer of power. Um, because what we know about oppression and systemic racism um, all the way to the individual level um, is that it is deeply entrenched. And um, until we start to change that um, in people, in processes, in practices, and in the policies that we enact, we're not going to see a difference. And so for us, the PDG is allowing us to think about this differently um, by starting with lived experts in real ways, which means that at all elevations of the system, we have to grow our knowledge. Um, we have to unlearn things that we have traditionally done. So when we have thought about how we went, how we went about our needs assessment and our strategic plan, we had to unravel all of that um, as we embarked on the process. And I got to tell you, it wasn't easy. Um, and a mark of white supremacy culture that we've learned a lot about is urgency. And we've pushed back on that hard. And the PDG has given us the space, the resource and capacity to do that, to say, 
No, actually, we have to do this differently. So when we think about code design in our state, we're bringing specific tools and resources to the table, and we're carving out the space through this grant to do the work a little slower and much more intentionally, which means centering in a really true way and sharing power with those impacted by our work. So for us, I just can't, again, say enough um, about what the grant has enabled us to do with that. We would have never had the kind of resources and capacity to do this work um, without it. So, um, and with that, I will turn it over to Camila. I'm going to turn it over to you first. I think you're, are you, you're responding in this one. Oh, I'm sorry, to oh, Pamela. Pamela. Oh, when I, I, I hear the words and you talk about we have to grow our knowledge and, and unlearn, um, that is so true. That is, is, is so true. Uh, because oftentimes, I think historically, we've thought in terms of, of equity as being equal. Everybody needs to be treated the same. Uh, and if everybody is treated the same, uh, then we're doing the thing that is fair uh, to the uh, individuals that we are, are serving or we're engaging with or interacting with. And that is far from the truth because everybody doesn't start at the same starting point. Uh, and everybody, uh, while there may be opportunities available uh, for everybody, those opportunities are uh, not evenly dispersed. Uh, and so what then do we do intentionally and purposefully to say uh, we are really, really focused on equitable um, services and equitable opportunities for uh, children and families that, that we are serving? Uh, and so as I was listening um, to um, the uh, presenters, I think that um, there were a couple of, of lines that I uh, wrote down and um, equity is not about us without us. It's not about us without us. Uh, authentic engagement is needed. Uh, relational trust among leaders, teachers, and, and families. So when I, I pulled those three things from uh, those uh, presenters, um, oftentimes we have individuals at the table who are making decisions for other people, about other people, without actually engaging them in those decisions. So one of the things that we've done uh, is we've stepped back and we've like started at the source. Uh, so we don't start at the top with what the administrators think and we don't start with what the departments think. We've started with the people that it impacts and you tell us your truth, you tell us your story. Uh, it's labor intensive, it does re require a lot of research, it does require a lot of evaluation, it requires those deeper dives uh, and you have to disaggregate the data. You have to go in there and say, I mean, you can't take this big picture approach and say, oh, look at all these great things that we've done. But did you do great things for everybody everywhere? Or did you do great things on the surface level for high level individuals? And we still have a segment of our population that we are not purposefully and intentionally impacting. And so we've been able to utilize uh, funds to actually do that and, and start to take a look at, at the data uh, and look at the services that are out there and the individuals who are actually accessing those services. Uh, we're implementing a new early child care management system that's going to uh, show us where these unduplicated counts or duplication of services are existing and, and, and where they're not existing because we think we're doing a wonderful job sometimes of getting the word out about uh, services that are available and we have a subset of population that does not have access to broadband um, and they are not getting this information and they there are services that are available uh, to them but if they're not accessible to them then the services are not available. Uh, so, uh, so things like that uh, have really driven our work. Uh, we're reviewing our systems and it is hard. It's hard sometimes to take a look at that thing that you've been so proud of for so long, uh, only to discover that there is 15 or 20 percent of the population that is not actually being impacted by the good work that you think that you're doing. And so we are intentionally looking at the good work and making sure that the good work becomes great work and that that great work is accessible and available to all in, a, in an equitable manner. And that does not necessarily mean equal. Kayla. I really appreciate just hearing from both of you and it's really powerful and, and the, the lessons that we need to take because uh, what I'd say is we're nowhere close um, and we never will be because it's a continuous learning process. And, you know, I, I just want to echo everything that you said and just to add on some of the, some of the specifics in our state where this is really coming into play as we think about what does equity mean in practice and what are we doing? We had a really difficult series of conversations around data, which was who are our priority populations and how do we refer to our priority populations? And the language around that, the stigmatization when we say, you know, 
kids on SNAP. That's not what we mean. We mean kids who are under-resourced, who are facing resource insecurity. So we wanted to think about our language much more intentionally. We wanted to think about who we're talking about, what data sets we're looking at, what does the, what, who's even in those data sets, who gets tracked by public data sets, and how do we think about that work in an equitable way and really digging in to, to what we mean. And one thing that emerged for us, for, as an example, is a priority population we would love to focus on and understand is how children who don't have, uh, who don't live in English speaking households, how they're engaging with our early learning system and early childhood system. And the thing is, we don't collect, you know, regular language data starting at age zero. We start to understand that at age five. So how can we, how can we better serve a segment of our community who might we might not be reaching because we're not translating into the right languages, who aren't finding the early learning opportunities that meet their cultural and linguistic needs. We're not even capturing that from the very outset. How can we do that better so we know um, whether our system is, is serving our community? And a big piece of that and that I'm really excited about for this upcoming year is, is, a, is a family needs assessment and thinking about it as a family demand survey which is what does our community actually want? We have a sense of what we say quality is. We have a QRIS. I don't know if families agree with that and to what extent what families want is reflected in that quality rating system. So I'm really excited for kind of the outcomes of that survey to think, what do families want more of? And as we are building our system, are we making investments in the areas that families want to see? And being able to break that out by um, different communities, different needs and different ages, all sorts of different levels of equity that we need to think about, including developmental disabilities and other needs. So I was really inspired, frankly, by the, the discussion that Oregon talked about yesterday with the family needs assessment and looking at you know, what they were able to capture and is just a phenomenal foundation for thinking about family demand. So one other thing, and I just really appreciate the, the point on sharing power. One of the things PDG has been able to help us with is develop a family, a parent and caregiver advisory council that we've been able to, you know, fund. So not just asking people for their time, been able to pay real stipends for the expertise um, that parents and caregivers bring. Uh, we're able to facilitate, send people to trainings, engage folks in a really authentic way. And to, to the extent that we're not facilitating this anymore, we have a parent who's now the chair of the council who sets the agendas, who leads the actual work. And when we have kind of key decisions, we make sure to engage our parent and caregiver advisory council. So for example, before this meeting, I sent those draft family demand survey questions to our parent and caregiver advisory council to understand, is this gonna capture what family wanna share with us? What other questions should we be asking in this survey? Um, you know, these are just little pieces of, of the whole picture that Kelly and Pamela talked about. Um, but this is where kind of the, the moments that this is really uh, the rubber meant the road for us. What does it mean when we're doing equity work in our state? Um, and there's so, so much more to do. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing how your states are working to grow your knowledge and eliminate systemic racism through policies and relationships and interrupting that power dynamic. Um, such powerful work. Um, I could listen to you, all, all four of you ladies, talk about this topic all day long because um, you really are doing some great work and you have some really great insight, but we must stay on track with our questions. Um, we know that the great work that you're doing um, comes with challenges and, and, and barriers that you've encountered then. Um, what are some of the challenges your state is facing and how are you overcoming them? And then the second part of the question is, how could federal policy and funding further support those challenges in the future? Pamela, would you mind starting us off? I think one of the things that uh, always comes to mind uh, when it comes to uh, challenges around this, this work uh, is the compartmentalization that often happens around departments where um, there is, um, you know, the, the power struggle and there is the, um, you know, the, the 
slow release uh, of, of power and control uh, because individuals are, you know, a little reluctant. We've done it like this. We've gotten, we've had the opportunity to make these decisions all along by ourselves uh, and we could govern ourselves uh, accordingly. And now there is this shared responsibility in these shared roles. And am, am I willing to give that up? So I think that uh, in the beginning for us, it was the the silos um, that were there uh, and, um, and, and lack of trust, uh, I think also. Uh, do I trust this other organization to uh, follow through and do the things that um, that they say they're they're going to do? Um, and I think for us, um, we had an extension of our steering committee, which were uh, work groups that were uh, that consisted of an, uh, another hundred or so plus individuals from a lot of different organizations and agencies. And it was just that initial getting that initial buy in that says we are in this together. Uh, these funds are going to are going to run out. Let's let's create our our shared goal and our shared mission. Uh, and whenever we would enter into any kind of conversation that seemed like it was going to be uh, halted or stifled, uh, let's go back to what our shared vision and our shared mission is, uh, because that's the thing that's going to always support the work when we go back to the thing that we share versus the thing that 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 is different. Um, and then the capacity or the ability to just give up some things. Like what's, what's the most important thing here? Uh, and are you willing to give up a little in order for us to actually gain a lot? So I think in the beginning, it was it was the, the silos and for everybody to um, kind of agree that we could disagree and then agree on some things that would move us forward. Like the work doesn't have to stop and we don't always have to agree on anything and everything. Um, but if we can uh, find those things that are commonalities and those things that we can agree upon, then we can move the work uh, forward. And I think that having the opportunity um, to have conversations around braiding and blending of funds, uh, because these dollars are, are, are gonna stop. And when these dollars stop, let's go back to our shared vision and mission. Does that stop? Well, that doesn't stop. So how then do we take the funds that we do have available to us and use those funds um, in a in a very creative and innovative uh, uh, kind of way uh, to keep this work uh, moving uh, forward? Um, so the funding that we do have and the opportunities that have been made available um, have been very helpful um, because if we probably didn't have this funding, we wouldn't still be at the table having conversations about how we utilize the funds that we uh, we have in our own locales uh, after this funding stops. So we've been um, very, uh, I think, purposeful and intentional about the things that we know we can build, the areas where we know we can build capacity. And then like writing down our challenges, like the ones that we continue to have, because there are still continued challenges around funding. There are still continued challenges around um, staffing and retention and, and bonuses. And, you know, we we have, you know, art funds that are, are, are here now, but when those run out, then what happens? We have PDGB5 money that's here now. When that runs out, what happens? Uh, so we do know that there are still challenges ahead, but as long as we're able to have those true conversations about where we are right now as a state, and I think for, for the most part, we've had some really, really, really good conversations with our partners, uh, real conversations about where we know that perhaps uh, we, we're going to get far in this journey, but we may not necessarily cross the, uh, the, the finish line, but we have plans in place for how we can make that happen afterwards. Kelly? Um, so I, I would just build on that and say, I think um, from our perspective, three things, and many of them dovetail with things that Pamela has just mentioned. And I would say, first and foremost, is sort of a short term um, in all the ways that you already have been, the feds have been just supporting us in pandemic response. So again, just the continued ability to be nimble um, and address things as they come, given not just within state context, but within communities within state context. Um, that flexibility has just really been huge. So however we can continue to do that, I just have to say um, I have always had pretty good luck with federal partnerships um, being in, in my role as a state leader um, across agencies with DOE, with, with HRSA, and with HHS. And just need to say that continuing to just pour um, you know, your energy into investing in the relationships with all of us is just key and critical. Um, and I think what that brings me to is sort of maybe some short-term and long-term, which is what we've heard here today and what we're hearing here all week is take the best. So a message to federal partners, I would say, is in helping us address our challenges is um, 
taking the best of what we're learning through this opportunity in the PDG and how can we think about applying that to other federal programs and, and services. And so I'll give you two examples. Two challenges that we've all talked about a lot here today that the PDG has brought to us is addressing equity in really intentional ways and capacity, which again, are two things that for whatever reason, even given where we're at in the world right now, continue to fall short. And so for me, um, I think those being two challenges, how can we take, again, the, these great lessons and um, the design work that we've done across our states and think about how it can be applied, um, not just in if there's an opportunity for more PDG policy um, and funding, but again, through other federal programs and services. So how can we think about equity um, in more intentional ways in CCDF and MCV and in uh, early intervention and preschool special education um, in Head Start, et cetera, et cetera, in child care. Um, how can we apply these lessons and how can we continue to think about which in, you know, in the current administration, um, build better back, build that back better plan. Um, we're seeing some of this, which is really great, but continuing um, to support states in our capacity efforts. Um, and again, I don't mean to be surface in my response, but just wanted to highlight some of those things for the short and long term, because I think for us, those will help us continue to address some of the biggest challenges I think that we're facing, both in pandemic response and in long-term planning. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kayla to finish us up on this one. Yeah, and just two things I'd add, because um, I, I agree with everything that has been said. One is, is a challenge that we face and um, is turnover and staff uh, sustainability. So as we have turnover at leadership level, staff level, all of that arch archival knowledge kind of goes out the door. And understanding how to archive information, how to keep work going, even as people change has been very difficult. And we actually just had a governor transition because Rhode Island's governor joined the, the Biden cabinet. So we went through this kind of during a pandemic. And what stuck out to me is that PDG was something that allowed us to bring new leaders and new staff to the table to say, hey, we have this work happening, please join us. We have this kind of support from the federal government. Um, but that's something that I think we'll continue to face and has been really helpful to have the, the federal opportunity be something that we can have as a through line across administrations and across um, you know, staff and leadership level changes. Another thing I'd add is just data sharing. This is something that we spend so much time on is trying to connect our health and human services data with our education data. And there's, you know, as, as Pamela was describing, there's the trust relationship, there's the sharing power, sharing goals um, that is needed to make that happen. But there's also just, I think, a lot of, um, you know, I don't want to say misunderstanding, but a lack of expertise in how to really engage with FERPA and HIPAA. And I think, you know, support from the federal government, which has happened and, and just continued support on how to come through those issues in a way that's compliant, um, but helps us meet the goals of, you know, an integrated data system to support our children and families um, is extremely helpful. So that's something that we continue to face um, and, and, you know, have appreciated all of the support on. And, you know, big shout out to Faith, who is facilitating this and, and to her team who have helped us think through um, just the importance of integrated data and how to bring people to the table in use cases, um, as well as you know, what, what really the opportunities are to come through those challenges. Really good points. Um, I really appreciated the transparency with you all, that you all um, in sharing your challenges, because I know that sometimes airing dirty laundry is, is difficult, but I appreciated that, um, that you are honest and transparent about that. So I'm wondering, um, just to continue kind of that, that vein of thinking, um, that, we, we, that we talked about how PDG provides states with funding. And so our last, our last question is, um, acknowledging the positive impacts of PDG, given the focus on systems, um, infrastructure building and capacity building, what are your hopes and ideas for how um, the Fed, federal government might continue supporting um, supporting you um, in this way with the, uh, focusing on infrastructure and capacity. You guys have alluded to it a little bit, um, but I'd like to hear some thoughts about that before we close. And then we'll go to our concluding statements. Um, who would like to go first? Do you want to go first, Pamela? 
I will. I'm going to okay. provide a, an earth shattering answer uh, to this <laughs> question. It's going to rock everybody's world. Um, but my hopes and ideas for how the federal government can continue supporting states in this way is to continue to provide funding. <laughs> um, the the key is we you know we. We all know that uh, in order to build capacity and for sustainability, uh, the funding has to be there. Um, but I would like to add, and I know that you know seems so special, um, but I would like to qualify that with purposeful data-driven funding. Because sometimes uh, funding is provided and uh, there are, um, you know, we give, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars and we say, yay, go conquer the world. Uh, and so sometimes uh, there has not been as probably as much depth of thought as to the populations of individuals. And there should be a little bit more targeted um, approaches to uh, to the funding and how the funding actually uh, is, is dispersed. Uh, and so without guidance, without individuals who are sitting at the table who are taking a look at the data, and who are doing some very intentional analysis and some intentional studies and, and looking at, at frameworks and really, really, you know, uh, you know, let, assessing uh, the landscape uh, where in the communities in which they're, they're serving and working, uh, sometimes those funds don't reach the populations uh, that they actually need to, to reach. Uh, so uh, continue funding, uh, funding that's very targeted um, and funding that will actually then go to increase um, uh, capacity and sustainability and support equitable um, um, distributions across our states. Awesome. Kayla? And I just add to that, you know, I think the, the beauty in PDG has been investing in capacity and saying that that is a priority. And so I think continued investments and really acknowledgement from uh, the federal government that capacity is a priority um, in this sector to be able to do this work helps us share that message at the state level as well. Um, and the second thing is I have really appreciated the coordination at the federal level across different grant opportunities. So Rhode Island was lucky enough to receive a P3 systems grant. I believe we heard about that opportunity at the last convening and then had the opportunity to apply. And we were able to write our shared goals of PDG into that funding opportunity and we're encouraged to do so. And as we receive that grant, we're integrating that work into our early childhood governance structure that PDG created um, and, and really being able to share the work. So that way it's not two grants doing separate things in the same space. It's really all one strategic plan that has funding and supports from different areas. And so I think the continued mindfulness just like that of coordinating the funding opportunities helps us continue to stay true to our early our strategic plans um, and allows us to make those really strategic investments. So we really appreciated that and, and love to see that. That's excellent. Thank you so very much. I appreciate you all taking the time to thoughtfully answer those questions. Um, but we are just about out of time and I really wanted to provide um, a time for you all to um, share some concluding thoughts. So we're going to have to shorten them just a little bit, but that's okay. Um, so if I would like um, Dr. George Ann, um, would you mind starting us off? Uh, so uh, first of all, Faith, thank you, uh, you know, very much for uh, the opportunity to participate in this plenary. And uh, Kelly and Kayla and uh, Dr. True Love Walker, thank you so much for uh, you know, this opportunity to share this time, uh, you know, with you. So I just want to, uh, you know, my reflections, uh, you know, that we've heard today and, uh, you know, as we go forward is that, uh, you know, certainly uh, what we've experienced, the pandemic and, and protest um, have put a laser, a laser focus uh, on issues related to racial equity. And the PDG grant, uh, you know, as I reflect on the PDG grant, uh, has really been a catalyst for supporting all of us as far as having uh, that focus on equity within our systems building. Um, you know, we've heard it, uh, you know, in the welcoming, we've heard it in the research to practice and as well as in the other sessions. And so what it says to us is that we all have to make a true commitment to dismantle systems of uh, inequality in each of our respective places and, and spaces. 
it requires that we we lean into those uh, you know those difficult conversations, like in the case of of um, of Oregon uh, when they realized that their approach was was not working, and they so they paused. Uh, from their approach, and they pivoted to engage partnerships uh, at the community level, which they found was successful. And so I really appreciated, uh, Faith mentioned uh, transparency, I really appreciated their transparency and sharing with us, um, you know, their experience, but their flexibility, and as we said, being nimble uh, to change their approach to successfully engage the individuals that they were seeking to engage, and that was uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color. But it also uh, demonstrates the importance of the practice of drawing on community expertise and provider proximity. They talked about the importance of talking to the individuals who are actually serving uh, you know, those families and not making assumptions and identifying strategic partnerships to ensure beneficiary voices included. And so, um, you know, that leads us next to, uh, you know, data systems and governance, which we've talked about a lot today. Um, and so, you know, each of our respective state governments manage billions of dollars, uh, be it uh, state, federal or local tax dollars. And so without the right uh, data infrastructure and governance, it's going to be impossible for us to ensure that those dollars are, are used. Um, are used well. And so, you know, the challenges of data is, is, um, is multifactored, including, you know, the inability uh, that has been noted to disaggregate by, you know, race and ethnicity. But, you know, we really need to rethink um, how we view and talk about data. Uh, I view data as social justice. And so we need data, a data infrastructure that will ensure that our states can report by you know, demographics and race to allow uh, for equitable services um, that are provided to children and families. But more importantly, it will allow us to change the narrative as far as how we talk about child family uh, outcomes. And so again, I want to um, uh, thank uh, everyone uh, for the opportunity to be a part of this PDG community, but especially for the opportunity to um, participate in today's plenary. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jordan. You're welcome, Faith. Kelly. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just take a quick minute here and also thank uh, my colleagues, Jamila and Pamela and Taylor. It has really, and Faith for organizing us. Faith, you are a magician at this work. I <laughs> um, just want to thank the three of you and, and you, Faith, for um, pulling this together and, um, you know, in so many ways, just what we've been able to share here is so representative of the magic of PDG and and why for us it truly has been that game changer. We're going to keep saying that. We're going to get t-shirts, y'all. Everyone, <laughs> anyone who's listening to this, we got to get some t-shirts made and uh, do this game changer thing um, in bigger ways as we move forward. But just, um, you know, I think what I want to do in this moment is just to say how critically important it is for us to um, to think about how this grant and the work that we're doing in early childhood and family systems really building that we're doing um, to continue to remember that it will not change if we aren't intentional about facing up to the things that need to change. Um, and that is been such a big part of this work for us, um, which has resulted in a lot of really hard lessons. Um, it takes a lot of courage um, to stick, stay in this with each other. Um, but I have to say that um, the most powerful lessons that we've learned in Washington have been um, the voices of those people that we impact every day. And I'll never forget standing with our tribes when we embarked on the needs assessment process and we said, we want to do this differently. And they said, okay, well, the first thing that we want to do differently is that we don't want to tell you what's wrong with us. We want you to highlight what's beautiful about what we do in our tribal communities and our sovereign communities for our children. We want you to highlight that too. And we want you to highlight that out front because that is what we're trying to change. That is what we're trying to do for all communities. We want children and families to have healthy, well experiences. And um, that changes the game for all of us when that happens because we all do better. Um, and so for me, I think about those moments when um, you know they held up the mirror to us and said, okay, 
if, if you really mean what you're saying about centering us and sharing power with us, then let's really start changing the way that we report on this and the way that we do this. Um, and so I, uh, I'm just really grateful. And I think right now what I want to do is just say thank you to them. I want to thank um, all the people who have continued to come to the table and um, engage in totally new kind of partnerships to be able to do this work differently. Um, because it is because of them that I feel like we're able to say in our state that it has been a game changer, which I'll just say the last thing, you know, for us when it comes to sustainability is that um, we were able to to pass historic legislation in our state this year um, in our session. And almost every single thing that is called out in that legislation is aligned with the PDG um, and everything that we've done. So we're really, really um, grateful and just want to say another thank you and pass it on to my colleague, Pamela, to share her closing remarks. So thanks to everyone. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. And uh, Kayla and Kelly, uh, Faith, this has been a wonderful opportunity to hear from you guys. And uh, and I, I will be quick. Um, Representative John Lewis devoted his life to um, uh, racial justice and, and equality. And, and he uh, he once uh, said, do not get lost in a, in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day. It's not the struggle of a week, a month, or a year. Uh, it is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. <laughs> and so I see this work that we are involved in right now, uh, that we have an opportunity to get in that good trouble and that necessary trouble and to make some noise for the early child care uh, and early education community. Uh, we are at the table. We have uh, stakeholders who are at the table, and this is our time to uh, to shine. Uh, so engage your communities, engage your stakeholders, and always be the person uh, in the sake of racial uh, equality and racial justice, uh, getting good trouble and necessary trouble. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela. <laughs> and Kayla, finish us up. Yeah, and just this has been an honor to be on the panel with all of you and so much fun um, to, to get to this and learn from you along the way. So very grateful, um, Faith, for reaching out to us and facilitating this and just grateful to learn from all of you. Um, just something that strikes me as we've been talking is that so often when discussions of equity happen, early childhood is not one of the bullet points and sometimes in those conversations, which is fundamentally strange to me because this work is absolutely at its core about equity and social justice. If we don't do this right, we are continuing the trends of under-resourcing exclusion um, that have happened for forever. So it, it is fundamentally about equity, uh, what we do, and I think that comes first. And so it's been inspiring to hear from everyone on this panel um, and throughout the last couple of days about how we're bringing that to practice. And the se second thing I just add is that um, it's really inspiring to hear with some other states because sometimes when you're mired in the day-to-day, -day, you're writing that email, editing that document, it's hard to remember what the big goal is and that uh, greater things are possible. So every time I read a press release from Washington about amazing, amazing legislation that just passed or is happening with Alabama's pre-K program or you know what's happening in Illinois, um, it, uh, it's inspiring and it reminds me what is actually possible. So just for everyone watching and, and all the other states who are colleagues, um, it's great to hear what you are doing because it, it reminds us uh, how far we can go. Um, and so just really grateful for all of our state colleagues. Thank you, Kayla. And thank you to our panelists. I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to sit at your feet and learn from each of you. Um, you both all are so wise and, and, and are, are doing your best for children and families. And it's, it's such a privilege to be able um, to listen to you and hear about the great work that you're doing. So thank you for your time and the effort that you put in for preparing for this panel. Thank you to our audience. We so appreciate your attention. Um, and we hope that you, um, if you have questions, we'll be sharing them with the panelists um, and so that they'll be responding to you afterwards. Um, and I hope that you continue to enjoy the annual con um, convening. Thank you so much, everyone.